thank you everybody for coming tonight and um, I want to make a few thank yous first um, I want to thank Anne Elisabeth Buxtorf first place for having us in the beautiful library of the Institut Francais and I want to thank the Institut Francais for um, being um, one century old this year congratulations and um, of course uh, I want to thank Céline and Laure for helping so much and working so much to make this evening possible and I'd like to thank Culture France as well because Culture France is helping us from a financial point of view and um, it's always very very helpful to have money that can help and uh, our two guests uh, tonight to talk about um, novel to talk about writing to talk about much more than that are in alphabetical order William Boyd on my left side and Marc Dugan on my right side. I'm sure that you know both of them very well. I'm, I will not tell you who William Boyd is. <laughs> yes, you know, being English, I guess that you know um, everything about him. Marc Dugan, of course, is a French novelist and uh, he had a huge, tremendous success with his first book, La Chambre des Officiers. He was working before in, in business and then all of a sudden he started to write and so he wrote that book and that book is something very special because he has got about 20 prizes yes yeah, but i don't care about it but yeah, yeah i know that you don't <laughs> care about it but i do care about it and yeah. uh, you know 20 prizes everything this this was shame for everybody else in france at that time and that book has been translated into english so you can find it in english and um, others are not yet translated but uh, they will soon be and you the malédiction d'edgar which is the last one no no. No, it's. Um, Which is the last one? No, the last one is this one. It's, uh, oh, yes. En bas des nuages, short stories. Yeah, short stories, yeah. yes. Yeah. This one, short stories. And then before that, we had those two yeah. big novels, that Une Exécution Ordinaire and La Malédiction d'Edgar. And we're going to talk about those in the coming minutes. Uh, William Boyd, your last novel, I guess, is this one is yes, o uh, Ordinary Thunderstorms. Yeah. And uh, it has yes. just been translated in French. It came out on April the 1st. Yeah. Poisson oh. d'Avril. Poisson <laughs> d'Avril. Uh. Oh, by the way, um, English or French? <laughs> Raise a hand. English. Okay, you won. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm afraid not. <laughs> no, no, but I, I, I'm afraid that you know people who can understand French can also in understand English. But mm -hmm. uh, some of the people that, that understand English does not understand French. So this is the very last one. Yes, yes. and it has just been published by Le Seuil a few days ago. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much. So these two gentlemen share a lot of things in common. Um, you're a little older, I guess, by. Uh, you know, four or five years, maybe? Uh, much, much older. I think. Much <laughs> older. No, 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 not <laughs> really. <laughs> and uh, you were both born in Africa. Yeah, yeah, in Ghana. Yeah, yes, yes, I was born in Ghana. In Ghana. And, and in Senegal. In Senegal. Yeah. So West well, Africans. West Africans. Two West Africans. You are both West, Africans. West African <laughs> babies, at least. <laughs> and then, yeah. uh, who knows? And um, you're both first place novelists. We will talk about cinema. We will talk about short stories later on. But you're, you're both novelists. And um, um, you're both working very hard on your novels. You're both serious novelists, doing a lot of research, doing a lot of work. Sure. But in very, very different ways. Mm -hmm. And um, um, what are your feelings right now um, about novel between, you know, on the French side and on the English side? I have the personal feeling that English writers believe still believe in classical kind of novels and in in france i have the feeling that there is the shadow of a doubt about that um <coughs> it's very difficult for me to make that judgment because i do try to keep up with contemporary french literature but i'm i'm not an expert um <coughs> but I, I i know from talking to French journalists that I think there's always a, a crise in the in the roman français but uh, um, I think there's and this is where I think Mark and I share a certain similarity of style and approach I think 
the whole business of uh, storytelling, of narrative, is still very strong in the English novel. And um, it, it, it sustains it. Whereas I get the impression, though I think it's changing slightly, there is still a kind of intellectualism, as I've heard it described, nombrilisme in the French novel, oh, yes. which, is, um, which distinguishes it from the Anglo-Saxon literary world. But I, I sense more and more that narrative and storytelling is returning to, to the French novel. It was, all, it was always there. And, and, but I, I feel uneasy making these comparisons. They're just um, hunches I have when I, because when I, I go to France a great deal and I, when I'm promoting my books in, in France, I'm very aware of this division being made. But Marx's books seem to me very... British, in a way, <laughs> which is a compliment, um, in that they're always different, uh, and they're always... I they appreciate. Have a, they have a very strong narrative dynamo to them, and that maybe makes them not typically French, in a way. I wonder if that's true, or if, if my hunches are, are wrong. I remember the critic of uh, Elle, uh, the, the newspaper, uh, the magazine in France, and she said that I'm the best American French writer. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I agree with you. I think that um, we have an intellectual problem in France, which is that we, you know, people are very, uh, uh, how to say, um, they, th they think that their own life is so interesting that it can make a masterpiece. And mm -hmm. I don't share this point, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I, I think my life is quite boring. And um, That's if you don't true. make an effort, <laughs> if you don't make an effort of imagination, I think there's no way to make uh, an interesting book. That's, that's why I, 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 have to, I have to confess it, because, and I told it to many newspapers, uh, my uh, background in literature is more English and American literature than French literature except, of course, the big uh, writers of the 19th century. But um, uh, I think that if you don't want to tell a story uh, by writing, uh, I, I, I don't understand what you want to do, really. Uh, and, and the problem is that uh, in France, uh, now people, they want to be original. They want to be, uh, and I, I think that uh, it makes distance with them, and um, that's it. I think uh, we we have to tell stories. We have to. Of course, it's not easy because I was reading recently uh, Kertec. This guy has been talking about the experience in Auschwitz. Uh, I'm not able to 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 talk about such an experience. So when you're not able to to write about your own experience. Uh, fundamental uh, in history, uh, you have to create something. You have to 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 make your your imagination working, and that's what, what I try to do. And your imagination works um, within history. Yes, because, because it's I, not exactly I, the same for 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 William. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's more. You know, I feel uh, that the 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 twentieth century, the last century has been a disaster for humanity. And we have to explain a few things about this century uh, concerning, you know, uh, regarding uh, communism, regarding fascism, regarding uh, America, the way it, um, it, it went. And I, I, for me, it's very interesting. To, to yes, but, you know, w when you work on, on, for example, uh, Edgar Hoover, right? Your book about Edgar Hoover. This one is absolutely rooted in the in true story of Edgar Hoover. Yeah. And uh, you cannot make the part between the things that uh, um, that are real and the thing that you create as a novelist inside the the story, the real story of. Um, yeah, Hoover. because I like to mix the fiction and the real history. I mm -hmm. think that nobody knows. You know, when something happened um, today or tomorrow. The first explanation made by the politics is a fiction. Then after, if you, if you take the, the, the example of uh, the Kennedy assassination, 
they made the most wonderful fiction about it. And so I feel authorized to go through that story by the mean of fiction. And that's why I allow myself to do. Maybe you can say it's not fair, but I don't care about it. <laughs> <laughs> and so th this book I is about Mr. Hoover and this other one because I I want to explain to you because uh, they are not translated yet and this one is about the the Irkutsk story this is the submarine that disappeared it's about the Stalin Putin yeah, and, uh, Stalin and, and, and all the good friends Putin and everything mm -hmm. so this is why uh, on your side um, William you are doing what, what we call documentation a lot well, I think I'm doing ex almost exactly what Mark described. I think the wonderful thing about being a novelist is that you can go further than the historian or the journalist or the, or the autobiographer or the biographer. Um, because if the facts aren't there, you have to stop. Whereas in, in the case of the novelist, uh, facts are not a problem. Because you've described it as fiction, everybody comes to the book knowing that this is your take, your understanding, your interpretation. Um, in, in my a novel I wrote called Any Human Heart, for example, the, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, a truly horrible couple, um, <laughs> have quite a significant role. Well, obviously, I never met the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Really? N but uh, <laughs> and, but uh, I, I sent my imagination to meet them, and the portrait, I think, that I paint of them is in, in a funny sort of way truer than anything that a, that a bi the biographer or a historian can paint. And I've had this confirmed by people who did meet them and who did know them. But it's purely the act of... After or before? Uh, af after. after. Uh, it's purely the fact of your, 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 your imagination can arrive at a truth in a way that the most diligent research cannot arrive at. And I think that's the great uh, power of the novel. And in a way, that's the power of the novelist to interpret our history, whether it's recent or ancient. And think of Hilary Mantel and Thomas Cromwell in, in Wolf Hall. That's a, a, a novelist in the 21st century writing about a, a very important man in the, in the 16th century. I mean, I'm, I've, I've confined myself to the 20th century, but at the same time, um, I feel that uh, my imaginary voyages into fact are um, closer to some kind of reality, because there is no reality. There are very versions of reality. But somehow, because it's advertised as fiction, um, you are allowed to let your intuition function. Um, and you're not constrained by, uh, by documentary fact. But at the same time, I have the feeling that your characters are so attractive uh, because they are doing something. They have a job. They are working seriously on something. They are very much into life. You know, take, for example, the Brazzaville Beach. So w what about apes? You know everything about apes these days. Chimpanzees <laughs> are your... Yes, best yes I'm an expert on chimpanzees. Yes. Um, and, you know, <laughs> same thing for <laughs> asthma <laughs> with yes. in your last in your last book. No. Well, it's f it's funny, and I'm sure you know Mark is an expert on submarines. You know, um, but you become a kind of pseudo expert because you do tremendous amount of you you inform yourself because your your fiction needs to be plausible. It needs to have an authenticity, and so you take enormous pains to get the details right. But then. The facts stop, and you have to take that leap uh, into the imaginary. Um, but it's true. You, you, I, I f have educated myself enormously in the course of writing my novels and, and writing films as well, um, that you, you become a kind of, uh, a, as I say, pseudo-expert. But funnily enough, um, I am invited by newspapers to write articles about chimpanzees and primates, um, and yet I'm not remotely qualified to do so. There's something about, because you wrote a novel about um, the pharmaceutical industry or primatology or surgery or whatever, you have a, 
a kind aviation of authority as well. Aviation, yes, you know, because you, you <laughs> share something about <laughs> aviation. So you are both into planes. Yes, both anoraks, as we say in this. <laughs> uh, no, it's um, but it's but true. You become a, a temporary uh, expert in this world that you occupy for the two or three years that you write your novel. I, I think that uh, William is right in the way that uh, when I, I wrote this book about um, the Kursk, this submarine we had uh, unbelievable wreckage in the in the um, the Barents Sea. I, I said to myself, if I make this book, I have to go in a nuclear submarine. Uh, I don't like the idea. I didn't like the idea, but I had to go. And uh, finally, I went in in, in the submarine. I spent uh, ten days. Uh, I went to the to the army, who likes me very much because <laughs> I shone this officier. <laughs> And um, so I had an authorization from the minister, uh, the, the minister of defense, and um, uh, they, they, they were exercised between the French army and the, the and the American army in the Mediterranean Sea. So they authorized me to 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 jump into that uh, submarine, and I spent uh, ten days in that nuclear sea submarine. And then I felt really what those guys felt being in that kind of. Uh, uh, submarine. And I think it's important, as William said, we are close. You know, I don't think the truth they is, is so much important. It's, uh, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a way to testify of something. It's, uh, I, I think that uh, scientific research on a subject uh, are important. But if you don't bring it to an emotional stage, it doesn't mean anything for the public. That's that's why I think that uh, regarding the history, regarding the history of the 20th century, if you don't have this emotional input, it's very very difficult for people to to share something about this history. And I, I I'm, I'm not saying that those who are working on history sociology and all these kind of things uh, don't make a good job they, and they help us very much I use I use a lot of work of uh, thesis and so on uh, uh, about a period of time but I think that uh, the memory works with the emotion and if you don't come into the emotion the the, the memory of people don't function Yes, I, I think you, you, you make it live and you make it personal. Um, it's, a very, it's very simple advice um, that uh, any recounting of a story, if it's personal, suddenly has, a, has an impact. Um, and there, there, there are fantastic non-fiction accounts of, uh, of events that take place, but there's something happens in that uh, transmutation of, from non-fiction to fiction that has a resonance with readers that's in entirely different. Um, and I, I've been asked, for example, to write biographies of, of people, and I've always said no, but I've written fictional uh, extracts from their lives. I've written about Brahms and Wittgenstein and uh, Evelyn Waugh and various people. I've put them in fiction, and I don't want to write about them as subjects of non-fiction because I would feel constrained and it would somehow lack that little magic dust of the imagination. Uh, whenever a biographer has to say, we can think that or it was possibly at that moment when, you realize that fact has got in the way and it's supposition, hypothesis, um, but that's not a problem for the novelist, and that's a wonderful liberation. Okay. So <laughs> I would just um, I wanted to ask you um, kind of a technical question. Uh, some of your novels are very linear narratives. You know, for example, your, your, um, this one, La Malédiction d'Edgar, is very linear. You start from one point and you go to the other one. And... Um, uh, th some are very, you know, uh, 
seriously made like uh, thrillers, for example. This one switches from one character to another character. But others um, are very risky. Um, and I'm thinking of the, the way you cut um, the, the, the story in the execution ordinaire and you switch from, the, from Stalin to the, the, the Sea of Barons and then you, 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 know, you cut things very, very, very sharp, just like that. I can like tell you something the editors don't like yet. Uh, I, I know, that this is why I asked uh, the question. It's not very good on and a marketing point uh, of view, you know. And, and, you know, on your site, uh, if you take your Blue Afternoon, for example, the, the, this is this incredible flashback that we have, uh, you know, all of a sudden, and which, uh, which rebuilds a novel inside the novel, and uh, uh, which is quite surprising. So, uh, what, what kind of are the, these things experiences that you want to to have? Or? No, I, I think it's more the the story you want to tell in a way can fit to any number of of formats. And one of the the great things about the 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 novel form is that you can do absolutely anything you want in it. Um, and it's quite interesting for both of us because we both work in the world of cinema and film, which is a world where you can only do very few things. So the liberty and the freedom you have in a novel is astonishing. You can write a 500-page novel about a minute in somebody's life if you wanted to. Uh, you can write a novel that features a cast of a thousand people if you want to. Um, you can write a novel that takes place in... Uh, 20,000 years in the future or in prehistoric past. Um, so when you get your idea for a novel, very often shortly after that idea begins to take shape, then a form of the novel begins to make itself clear. I, I'll give you one, one example. If Brazzaville Beach, which is the first novel I wrote uh, from the point of view of a woman, so I was changing sex for the duration of the novel. I and can I do that. Uh, well, I, ha I, I, have my, I have my... And what a woman, my dear. <laughs> that's a character. That, that's uh, something, really. Yes. Yeah. J'ai mes astuces. Uh, but uh, um, <laughs> it's, it, 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 I was very worried about this challenge that I set myself because I realized f that this novel had to be told from the point of view of a woman. And so I thought, how do I do this in a way that... Uh, gives me the maximum opportunity. So I decided to use the first person singular, I did this, I did that, and also the, the third person, she did this. So I could see hope from the inside, subjectively and objectively. And so as we cut from we, the novel, is her life in Africa told in the first person singular, and she flashes back to her marriage in England, which she tells in the third person, hope did this, hope did that. But it was a it was a kind of safety net for me to allow myself to present her in the round, in and not take huge risks as a man writing from the point of view uh, of a woman. So the form of the novel um, was very much dictated by this risk I felt I was taking as a as a male novelist writing from the point of view of a woman, and it's it it, it worked. Um, yeah. So it was not it was not it worked. It was not um, and it still works. It wasn't <laughs> um, a whim. You know, it was mm. something that was dictated by the task that I had in hand. And similarly with my my new novel, Ordinary Thunderstorms, which is a kind of neo Dickensian novel, a sort of homage to the great nineteenth century novelists. I decided to adapt. The, f the form that they used of, of omniscience, that I am God in my world and I can enter the heads of any of my characters whenever I want and occasionally I will speak directly to the reader. Mm -hmm. So the form of this 21st century novel is in fact very 19th century but um, adapted slightly. So very th it's, it's um, you know, form and function, it's Bauhaus, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it fits the task your storytelling ambitions set you. Mm -hmm. Is it the same for you, for the um, execution ordinaire, for example? Yeah, I think the, the, um, the way... I, 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 I do prefer the first person. Um, I don't know why, because uh, all my characters absolutely don't look like me. But, but I, I, I feel more comfortable in the first person all the time. But my next book, which will be released in September, uh, there's no advertising. 20 pounds? Uh, uh, no, <laughs> no, no twi 20 and a half. <laughs> no, uh, I, 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 I wrote it at the third person because I, 
I didn't feel comfortable with the first person. I don't know why. But there's no rule. I, I think that wh when you have discussion with the editor, my editor being uh, Galiba, uh, very conservative, and uh, I think that all the editors have the the deep feeling that the readers are stupid or not stupid but not that intelligent to understand that if the structure is a little bit complex it's too much for them and I hate that and uh, but they say you know it's, it's a little bit difficult to, to read and so when I, uh, I, I but I, you know it's for, for Hoover uh, I just wanted go f to st to start from the beginning yes, to, the end. to the end that, mm -hmm. that, that's it for uh, for for the execution ordinaire it was different because i was talking about stalin i was talking about putin i was talking talking about a particular event which was the wreckage of the submarine so I'd, i just wanted to mix all that but there's no rule i um yeah, uh, as William says, you just have to feel comfortable with with what you're writing. You know, you're, you're very free in literature. You're very free. We have both a big experience now in cinema, and in cinema, you're not. You're absolutely not free to do uh, what mm -hmm. you want. So it's really the good uh, media to mm -hmm. be to be free. So we're going to talk about cinema, but before we talk about cinema. I'd like to talk about short stories because you are both short storytellers as well. And um, I have the feeling that uh, short stories are a field of experiences for you, trying different ways of um, narration. Yes, uh, um, mm -hmm. I, t I use short stories almost as a kind of laboratory to, to, to do experiments uh, in. And I've written a lot of short stories. I've published three collections of short stories and I have another one I, th I think nearly ready so I must have written 60 short stories or so um, in my career and often they're they're more experimental than my oh yes fiction. they are they are but I think that's something to do with the short story form itself it's um, Edgar Allan Poe defined the short story very simply as a narrative that should be read in one sitting and we don't read novels all at one go, but we do read you know, 10 page, 20 page, 30 page short stories in one go. And the experience of that, that aesthetic experience is quite different from reading a novel. So I, f I think the two forms, although they're very close, are, are quite different. I mean, people often say the short story is like the string quartet and the novel is the full orchestra. But I think that's a false analogy uh, because you can do anything in a short story that you can do I in a novel, whereas you can't do everything in a s string quartet as you can do in an orchestra. I think the, the best analogy is a literary one. I think to see the short story as the lyric poem and to see the novel as the epic poem. Um, and the intensity of experience when you read a lyric, short lyric poem is quite different from the experience of reading a long epic poem. So I, I think the two forms, although they're in entirely the, the same on the surface and you have exactly the same literary tools at your disposal, have an effect, particularly on the, on the reader, that is different. And so you can do different things. I wrote a short story, a uh, very short short story called Lunch, which is actually a history of just six lunches and what he ate and what he drank and who was there. But amazingly, you have an entire life falling apart as he recounts his six lunches. Impossible to do in a novel, something like that. Um, and so the, as a writer, the attraction of going to the short story form is that you're, you're using different muscles, if you like, than you are when you're writing a novel. So the, the aesthetic experience for reader and writer, I think, is, is quite different. Mm -hmm. um, it's not exactly the same feeling that we have uh, with your book of short story, which is more mm. around one theme and one kind of character. It's depressed men. <laughs> yeah. Usually. Uh. Mm. As Chekhov says, he said, sorry, uh, how can I write so depressive things being so happy myself? <laughs> But um, I think that the the um, I have two uh, 
two big writers for me in the past, uh, huge giants, Chekhov and Raman Carver, for other reasons, but and none of them ever wrote a novel. They just wrote short stories. I think the problem is short st short stories are very popular in England. They are not are in they France. Really uh, William? Yes, I think <coughs> the, the, the taste for short stories, I mean, publishers might disagree, but um, readers, I think, still have an enormous mm. taste for short stories. It's, it's much harder to get them published. But I think it exists in France. My short stories have been translated into French, and they sell extremely well, yet if yeah, you write... Yeah, because you're William Boyd. <laughs> no, no, but really? Mm. No, but I think if you, set, if you write a short story, no. it's very hard to get it published in. There aren't, there aren't magazines or journals that publish them. They, it's as if the, the form has died. But I think amongst readers, there's still a great taste for them. And but um, do you reach the same kind of figures uh, for your sales, for short stories? No, I don't, think you no. I don't think you do, but... Um, uh, you you still sell uh, you can still sell numbers that astonish publishers mm -hmm. so um that's what i think is interesting mm -hmm. so the taste for short fiction mm -hmm. is there but i do think i mean again my experience is that i do think that the in the anglo-saxon tradition particularly I I in america even more so than here the short story is sort of having a kind of revival it's almost mm -hmm. A lot of young writers are publishing books of short stories first rather than novels, yeah. particularly in the States. It's maybe something to do with the rise of the creative writing the Creative school. writing, yes, but of it's course. But the, uh, the sense of the form uh, is, is not dying. It's, it's quite lively, mm -hmm. but the industry has not caught up with, with readers' desires yet. I think in France it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really a problem when you want to publish uh, short stories because the, the publisher are, are very scared about it. The figures are still good for you, still good for me, but uh, it's uh, one third of what it should be f for a novel. So they, uh, when, when you say, I have short stories, say, okay, well, can we wait a little bit? <laughs> or maybe uh, in, in 10 years or... <laughs> But I think the, the the form of the 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 shape of the the the, the, the short stories. I think it's um, for me it's a, it's a mean of writing w where I feel uh, the most the biggest freedom. You can talk about everything, short a little bit longer. In this book, I made a, a short story of a hundred pages, but it's still a short story, and some some are just. Uh, 15, 20 pages. I think it's, um, for me, it's a part of literature. Uh, and, 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 and you can't, um, it, it, it's, you, you can't just focus on, 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 uh, on big novels of 500 pages, uh, one block. You know, I, I don't think it's a good idea. But, um, and, and finally, what I'm surprised is that uh, f for the cinema and for television and so on, for theater, the, uh, I'm very m much asked uh, about my novels, maybe more than about my, short my short stories, stories maybe mm -hmm. more than my novels mm -hmm. somewhere. So it's. Um, I think in some ways, if you're you know, the cinema feeds on on literature and in some ways it's much easier and more satisfying to adapt a short story than it is to cut down a novel, because often you, you have to add in stuff for when you adapt a short story. But um, no, I think it's, it's, it's imagine saying to poets, you can only write epic poems. You cannot write a short 10 line lyric poet, poem. That's when you see how it is part of literature, as, as Mark says, and it is a, a form that functions in its own way with its own particular strengths and its own appeal. It's, it's different, you know, it's not a mini novel. It's uh, it's a uh, it's not uh, a bite-sized novel. It's uh, it's something intrinsic with its own integrity. Absolutely. Okay, so you two gentlemen share something. You are novelists who make films. Uh, what so we share is that we have a house in Dordogne, both. <laughs> oh, you you have also a house that, that, in Dordogne. Yeah, yeah, so that's the most congratulations important. after to that. Both of you. <laughs> yeah. Nothing is it's important. Nice place to live. <laughs> and, uh, Nice place to have a house. And um, so you do films. Yeah. How did it start? 
How did you do that? Uh, you, you started to write, um, you know, dialogues. You started to no, write no, 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 absolutely not. It's st it started when my uh, La Chambre des Officiers has been adapted to cinema uh, by uh, François Duperron. So it started this way. I sh I saw the film. I was very um, happy with the film, and I said to myself, uh, "It should be fine to do it myself." But you know, um, nobody asked me, so uh, I, I I just. Uh, kept going uh, writing and suddenly uh, two years ago um, a big French producer producer producer, producer um, called me and say I like very much uh, the first 80 pages of your last book I say why don't you like it all he said you know it's just a problem of money if I make all of it it's a hundred million dollars if I just make the, the 80 the, the first 80 pages, we can make a film with 5 million euros. I think I, I, I understand your point. So, uh, so we started to discuss and he, s he said, so I want to make a film. I said, just, just go buy the, the rights. And, um, and he said, and, and finally at the end of the discussion, after two or three glasses of red wine, he said, why don't you want to, to make it yourself? I said, why me? He said, because you're a writer. And you have been uh, the chairman of uh, an airline in the past, so both makes a director. <laughs> I said, it's, yeah, it's a flying high. <laughs> if you see, see, see it that way, why not? And, and we started, and we, we made the film. And I made the second one for television. Uh, so uh, you did both the script and the direction? Yeah, mm -hmm. everything. Everything. Not acting, should that be a disaster, but... Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Just uh, yes, writing, and it's very interesting. I think we will have to share our experience with uh, with William because when 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 you are uh, writing a, a script from your own novel, it's a work of castration. So you need to cut everything, you know, uh, because the literature dialogues, uh, the dialogues in literature, are absolutely not the same than in cinema, and so it's it's a it's a it, it's a work of humility, where you have to consider that uh, things that sounds very nice when you read it in a book are awful in a film, or, or look ridiculous sometimes. So that's, that's the biggest part of the work. It's not really adapting for the cinema. It's, it's not that difficult, I think. Maybe you, 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 you tell what you think. But, uh, but the the problem is to 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 make it shorter and make it accessible for 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 people yes i agree i mm. i i have a bit of a, an idée fix about um the novel and the cinema um there's an assumption that the two forms are very similar but in fact they're not they're very different um i always make this comparison that if you go to see the opera by Verdi of Falstaff, you don't come home and read Shakespeare's The Merry Wives of Windsor and say, what a terrible adaptation of the Shakespeare play. Um, the two art forms are allowed to coexist without one being used as a, 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 a kind of judge on the other. But f films are always judged by their literary sources and they will always suffer because, again, what we said at the beginning, you can do anything in a novel. But in, when you come to a film which has its own strengths as a medium, um, you find you can only do so much. It's a world of constraints, of parameters, of compromises, because, fundamentally, it's photography. There is basically, in cinema, one point of view, which is the camera lens. So you're always looking on. It's very, very hard in a film to be subjective. In a novel, it's effortless. When you think of how do you enter the heads of a character in a film, you have very simple devices. You have voiceover. Well, you can't have uh, an entire film with voiceover, though Martin Scorsese tried in The Age of Innocence. Um, but you, and you have very good acting, but then even that is limited to compared to the nuances of psychological behavior you can describe in a novel and you can sometimes use the camera as a point of view of a character so that I'm looking at you and we can shoot it from there and it's and that's about it that is that is how subjective you can get in cinema 
So you, loop, you move from this art form of total freedom, the novel, to another wonderful art form of massive constraint, I would say. And, and so you have to play to its strength. Yes. And there's money on top of it. Well, which is know, another let's constraint. Let's, yes, yeah. and actors. <laughs> um, but uh, no, it's it's a world of. Uh, uh, but it's it's it has its own pleasures. It has its own strengths. But when you do both, as as Mark and I do, there is no comparison. I think, in as an speaking as an artist, uh, when you look at the freedoms you have as a novelist and the freedoms you have as the most sought after. Uh, revered filmmaker, um, you are handicapped, um, and so you you if you don't like the heat, stay out of the kitchen. But uh, it's a very very different art form, and I think that the the two should be allowed to e exist separately and not constantly be compared one to the other because um, film will always suffer in the comparison. And how did it start for you? Well, for me, it was um, I always wanted. You know, I, uh, I'm sure it's I always loved movies, and I always thought when my writing career began um, that uh, that it would open the door to write films. As I wanted to be a, a screenwriter, um, but of course it's the the old catch twenty two. The, they say, "Have you ever written a film?" And you say, "No, but I would like to write a film." Well, you can't write a film until you've written a film. You know, it's that terrible dilemma. And luckily for me, um, this is going back to the the early 1980s, when Channel 4 started up, um, they decided not to ask screenwriters, they decided to ask novelists to write a film. And the only thing they said, it had to be contemporary and it had to be set in present-day Britain. So various novelists at the time, including me and Salman Rushdie, for example, and Kazuo Ishiguro, had the chance, by Channel 4's generosity to write a film. And of course, as soon as you've written one film, now you've broken Catch-22, you can write another. And so my film writing career began. And I've always kept it going alongside my novel writing career for, for all sorts of reasons. Pleasure in the medium, you know, you earn, you earn some extra money as well. And uh, I think it's very good for a novelist to do something else other than write novels all the time. So there's almost a kind of social ambition. You have colleagues. You go to meetings. Um, you, ha uh, it's, uh, you have you're to the be bus. You have to be on time. Or well, you're 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 one amongst equals, let's say. But uh, it's a, it's a, it it stops you being totally self-indulgent and um, and selfish. And so I think uh, I I have really enjoyed having this double life. But there's absolutely no doubt that. I regard myself as a novelist first and foremost, and there's also absolutely no doubt that the, the artistic freedoms I enjoy as a novelist are incomparable with whatever minor freedoms I enjoy as a screenwriter or, or producer or, or director. Mm -hmm. in, your, in your bamboo book, um, you, you have a little text, a couple of pages about this, and you say in that when I have to um, shoot a film after one of my novels, it's like put, putting down the house and rebuilding it stone after stone. Yes, I, I've, I've tried to find various metaphors uh, that work, and um, I, I have several, actually. Um, one of them is writing a novel is like swimming in the sea. Writing a film is like swimming in the bath. Uh, which is quite a good one. Uh, the other one, which I think is interesting, is that when you, if you, if you, does that, when sculptures, sculptors look at a block of marble, sometimes they see the statue in the marble, and it's like a question of chipping away the marble to reveal the statue inside. For the screenwriter, you have the statue there, and then you have to make another statue that looks like it. So you have, um, imagine you are faced with uh, Michelangelo's David, and you have to sculpt Michelangelo's David from, this, from the existing sculpture. Um, what remains will probably have only one arm and be much smaller and not so nice. And similarly, there's your beautiful house. Tear it down and rebuild it. Um, it won't look like the original house, but it will still have the same number of rooms. And uh, you know maybe the chimney will be a bit askew, but it will be sort of like your original house. So these metaphors, in a way, show you, particularly with adaptations. So I think the original screenplay is a different animal, but 
the, ad the, the business of adapting and is, is a kind of craft, I think, rather than an art. And uh, it has its own particular skills. But what you're left with is, also, is something quite different and usually smaller than the original you started with. And I guess your next one uh, will not be adapted. It's a new story that you were writing for the next film. Uh, the next film, yes. Um, for the next film, it's uh, it's going to be. It should be a film in English, um, with uh, English money. <laughs> market reasons. Market reasons, because the the the, the market is much wider on the. Um, English uh, language than French language, and there are good reasons for that. Um, yes, I started from uh, a project of a book. I, 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 I started to write, and I didn't finish it. I, I jumped into another book um, that was last year. And, um, and finally, this story uh, pleased my producers. And um, and we decided to to go on with this um, this original idea. So now I have to to write the script, but it's going to be you know it's not going to be that difficult. I think um, because it's more I should say more popular. The idea is more popular. It's a it's a thriller. It's a political thriller. Um, looks like a bit for those who've seen it. Uh, the Ghost Writer for Polanski. And um, this, they are the same producers, that's why they want to make it again with me. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we're going to make the same money. Uh, and um, so they offered me um, Clive Owen and uh, Colin Farrell and uh, maybe Liam Neeson too, uh, to, to, to come into to that project. But of course now it's only a project. So. And, um, I like this idea because I, I, I like the, the, the experience of making a film in English with uh, English crews. But that would be uh, much different from a, a French film. Because the problem with the, the French films is always limited uh, in terms of uh, audience. Because, um, because the language is, um, is the kind of fans to uh, for 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 a lot of people in the world and um of course when you're writing when you're directing um, i think that you know there are two types for me i don't know if i don't know if williams shared this but um this point of view but there are two type of directors those who come from writing and those who come from the camera and in France, I think that the, the, the big mistake is that many people, directors coming from the camera, think that they can write themselves the script. And a lot of them uh, face failures with this kind of uh, idea. And, and I think that uh, for us, the problem with all the technicalities we, uh, we 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 face is that we have to of course to accept that people know this those problems better than we do um especially the director of photography is uh, I, I don't know if you share this experience but i yes I, I i do absolutely i think it is the ultimate collaborative art form and i i blame the cahier du cinéma for inventing the concept of the auteur because stupid yeah i think mm. it's it's been disastrous for world cinema because uh, having directed a film myself and i didn't call it a film by William Boyd or uh, uh, anything like that. I, I didn't take what they call in Hollywood the possessory credit um, because I could not have made that film, even though I wrote it and directed it and s cast it and sat in the editing suite with the editor without the contribution of everybody else. Um, and I, so I think this is part of the problem that the, 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 the auteur theory, and I'm probably shouldn't blame French cinema because I think the first director who took the possessory credit was an English director, David Lean, 
who insisted that it was called a David Lean film. So we're to blame as well. But since then, every, was good. E was good. Every, every kid who comes out of film school and makes his, first his or her first film calls it un film de, you know, and it's, it's, it's a, a false emphasis. And I think it gives rise to many of the problems of cinema that somehow the director is the one guiding presence, the one visionary contribution to the film. It's not true. Uh, it's, a, it's a real collaboration. Mm. And um, once you realize that, once you ask your director of photography to frame the shot, it's going to be much better than the framing you thought of. Once you ask the art director to create a set that looks like uh, uh, a nuclear wasteland, uh, then it's, that's what he contributes. And the actors who who uh, say the lines you've written with their own particular talents and skill contribute hugely. So I think it, if you go into cinema with that sense that it's a collaboration, then everything changes. If you go into c cinema thinking it's me, then uh, you're wrong. Um, write a novel. Then you have perfect autonomy. <laughs> you know, but you, yeah, you don't have it in the cinema. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's what I like too because um, I think the problem is when you're writing, you're really by yourself, you know. And even if you're in Dordogne, having a good time, uh, good wine and <laughs> good foie gras and, and so on, um, days are long. <laughs> and when I, I, I like both. Yeah, uh, I like very much uh, spending one or two months just writing. And after I like this, um, this team, you know, uh, uh, when, 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 it's w when, when the film starts, that means the money is there, and then you can see something going up, you know, and, uh, and then we start to discuss with, with the art director, with the director of photography, and, we, and, and I, I, I like both, in fact. And, and now, after two films, um, I have the feeling that I, I, I can't stop cinema. Even uh, I start with the theater in uh, in Paris in, um, in September with uh, two plays. Uh, I, I don't know. I, it's a new experience too, but I, I, but I want to do it because it's fun, and we need fun too. Even though you know, I, I know a lot of writers who just want to suicide. It's not <laughs> my case, um, and I like you know this new experience coming up. And when we have this opportunity like William and I we have the we are lucky to do to to that to find people who trust us enough for this new experience like cinema like theater and I think it's fantastic to to take it yes I, I agree the, the fun quotient is 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 very important it's a, a um, but it's also I think uh, I mean your life, Mark, is it different from mine. You have worked in, in industry, but I think it's very important for the, a novelist, and I've been writing novels for 30 years now, to get out in the world. And um, making a film, uh, for all its problems and hassles, is actually a kind of business experience as well as an aesthetic and social one. So it makes you, uh, I think, a, a more interested and interesting person as a result of having having gone through having jumped through all the hoops we have to jump through in order to make a film and the great liberty you have as a novelist is you can then say thank you it was great uh, but I'm going to retreat to my study for a year uh, see you later um, because uh, but it's so we are we are um, I think very lucky to be able to do them both but I think as a principle it's a good idea for a, a novelist to do something else, to, to teach or to, to do journalism or, or to, to travel and write about that, just to, to, to enlarge the world you inhabit. You mean um, the, the pressure of the uh, English-speaking word on our uh, culture? Mm, yes, yes. Um, no, I mean, it's for me, you know, for me it's very different because I'm, I don't feel things, I, I'm not res representative of the French writers and the French culture because um, I'm not really French. Um, 
because my, my grandparents were Irish on my father's side. My, my grandfather met the war in the US uh, Navy, so we have uh, a lot of input from the American side, you know, and, uh, and my mother came from Poland, so Poland, so, uh, so I'm French, but um, I, I don't feel, I, I, with France I'm always just, you know, reluctant somewhere to, to many things. That's why I like uh, the, the uh, I, I think that's the, the problem is that um, we don't have a, a problem with the, 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 the English. We, we, we have a problem with the US in the way that they are very imperialistic. And um, the way um, they make cinema, the problem is that maybe the, the best cinema in the history comes from the US and the worst too. But at the moment, I think we, we, we've got the worst, um, uh, <laughs> mainly. Uh, I remember, I, I, I love the, the cinema from the 70s, for example, when um, you could have a bad ending in a film, but it's so far now it looks like uh, pre-historical. But now you, you have the feeling that it's a, it's a, product, it's a product. They, when, when you have a discussion, I had a discussion with, with, with American uh, producers and they talk about cinema as um, um, a guy from the city here will, 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 will talk about financial products or uh, about soap or cars or, you know, and the artistic um, becomes so far from that. I feel uh, very bad with this. Uh, and, 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 and what I like is that that's, that's why I'm very much in favor of uh, a European uh, film uh, development. I, I'm working on a project with Germans, 50-50. I, um, I hope I'm, I can make this, this uh, film in English. And I think it's very important to, to do something together because the, the U.S. are so imperialistic. That, uh, in terms of culture, and, 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 and culture doesn't mean anything uh, in, in terms of cinema. And, 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 and there's a, a huge impact, because when you release a French film, they tell you, okay, is it comic? No, it's dramatic. Oh, Jesus Christ, it's dramatic. So maybe you can have uh, 150 theater in France? That's fine? Yes, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> uh, how much we can make with 150? Because uh, when uh, Scorsese, who was a good guy, basically, but when, when, it, when it comes with, with the film, he's got uh, how much? 5,000 theater in France. And, and when, so now in terms of distribution in France, you've got the American films first, and the remaining is for us. I don't like this too much, honestly. Of course, they like the f those films. They you like know. them. Yeah, yes, they, they like them they because well. it's it's you know the problem is that it's the same in literature. It's the difference between I would say art, culture, and entertainment. Now, uh, from the discussion I have with the producers in France, they say that the public goes more to entertainment than culture. Culture is very much reduced. Even in literature, uh, dramas, they don't want to hear about that. They just, you know, there's a financial and economical crisis. And they feel that if they go to the cinema, they don't want to have to think about anything. They don't want to be, that you impose them to think about something. So the, I, I remember t 10 or 20 years ago, the, the share, uh, in the public uh, was interested in, I would say, more intellectual films, was three, four times more than now. Than now. And I think there's a, a, a movement uh, against the culture uh, in France, as maybe as well as, as in England, but that makes that entertainment is, the, the people just want to be entertained, and that's it. And what, 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 I'm not criticizing uh, the, the American films because, as I told you, for me, the best of cinema comes from the U.S. 
a different period of times of time but uh, I think that today there's such a pressure uh, from the money that's the general problem you know uh, m money is everywhere and uh, uh, that's ex exactly what happened when when uh, um, my, my, my first film was a, a very I can s say it modestly but a huge um, critical success in France then I saw the producers for my second film, so I said so, said, yeah, not so bad, but, you know, you can make the same in English, and instead of having the French public, we're going to have the French public, the uh, English public, the German public, the, 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 the public from Japan, from Korea, because you just you make it in English. So, with the same amount of money, or, you know, roughly the same, you can have a larger public. So that's a fact. Wh what can we do? Did you make Stars and Bars with Daniel Day-Lewis? Yes. Uh, oh, uh, my uh, favorite uh, movie. I've <laughs> seen a million movies in yes. my lifetime, well, but it's my favorite. It was, it was ahead of its time. That's what I think. If only we'd made it 10 years yes, later, exactly. it would have been an enormous Nobody hit. No, no. It's, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis had only made uh, his first film, My Beautiful Laundrette, when we cast him. Yeah. But he came on to our film having shot um, the unbearable likeness of being. So he was n not, people did not want us to cast him at all. Uh, and we had an incredible uh, American cast in the film. Uh, great Irish director, Pat O'Connor. It was made by Columbia. It was a Hollywood movie, Columbia Pictures. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, everybody got fired before the, <laughs> the film was released. And it was just... Uh, kind of flushed away down the, the, the toilet. It even had a black and white poster. Can you believe it? Saving money on the colored inks. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, it has, a, it has a life on, on DVD and, uh, uh, and cable television, so it, it pops up from time to time. But it's a very curious film because it was almost like the, that sort of, uh, I don't know, I'm saying that like Richard Curtis' Four Weddings and a Funeral genre but made 10 years early. And it's, uh, and it's the strangest film in Daniel Day-Lewis's filmography. The best. The best and he, uh, you know, he'll never do it again. So I, I have That's hopes right. that the That's film right. will live on as a kind of curio, if, uh, if nothing else. So I think it's the best, uh, together with Philip Seymour Hoffman. Uh, uh, both are, the two, for me, the two best actors in the world, yeah. Daniel D. Lewis and uh, Philippe. Yeah. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't get them. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm so I'm sorry for that. I, I don't, partly because of this argument that I feel that the two forms should be allowed to coexist. Um, and Vladimir N Nabokov said when he saw Stanley Kubrick's version of Lolita, which if, if there ever was an unfilmable book, uh, that was Lolita, but actually it's not a bad movie. And he said, um, actually, you know, film, films that are based on novels should try to be a vivacious variant of the original. And I think I've stuck with that phrase, vivacious variant, um, which is a slight Nabokovian sneer to it, I think. But uh, it's true, they should be... They, and I think what happens is that... Um, the people see the film and they go back to the book because they know that the aesthetic experience of reading is entirely different from the collective theatrical experience of, of viewing a, a, a film. Um, we're in the process of filming my novel, Any Human Heart, at the moment, and I think we'll do it justice, but there's no doubt that what I'm looking forward to is, is is many more readers of my novel because people will see the te it's a television adaptation, but they'll be taken back to the book. So I always feel quite relaxed about it uh, in the sense that the book is always there. The film may may come and may go, but the the two the two um, art forms exist quite separately and distinctly. And I don't think the film detracts from the, the novel at all. If anything, it's the other way around. People, uh, you know, like in your experience, you don't want to see Daniel Day-Lewis playing my character, Henderson Dawes, because you have a, a mental image of the character having read the book. But um, that image, has, even if it existed for a, 
uh, a moment has gone, and the book, which was published in 1984, is still selling away, uh, you know, a quarter of a century <laughs> later. So um, I, I feel, as an author, no qualms about having my work adapted. In fact, I insist on adapting my own books, and I've adapted um, four of them now. So um, it's not a it's not an issue. I don't feel anything is lost, and if anything. I gain from new readers who come back to the book. I think if you, you know, so there are two, two different uh, options. If you, if you read, the, if you if you wrote the book, uh, if you make the script yourself, and if you uh, direct the film yourself, um, it should be not too far from the book. But I I agree with you when it's. Uh, uh, when the book a has been written by someone, the script by another person, and, and the director himself had another vision, then at the end I understand that, of course, the problem is that it kills your imagination. And I, I have the same problem. And I, and, I, and I meet sometimes some of my readers who say, I'm not going to see your film. Uh, I say, well, that's nice. Why? Uh, just because uh, I have... S an idea of your characters, and I don't want to get your idea. But I said, I wrote the book, so I know what my characters are. I don't care about it. I just want to to have my own vision. And I, you know, uh, fundamentally, I agree with that. And uh, and I think it's a it's a big mistake. You know, I, I I've I've seen the problem with my my sister, who's. I don't know if she's. I think she's. She's well known in England. She's uh, yes, absolutely. She Fred is. Fred Vargas. Uh, she she writes thrillers, and um, and the, uh, and all the adaptation of her books failed. Uh, in uh, she she's, she has huge numbers in literature, but the adaptation of her books in France, uh, in films, uh, just just failed because. People have such an idea of a hero that they don't want to see him on a screen, and uh, so now the no more adaptation of, of her book, uh, even if she's one of the two or three writers who sells uh, the most in France, because um, there's a, this reluctance from from people. They don't want to see this uh, this this character Adamsberg on a screen, and I and I. I, I, I understand that. Uh, we are Sorry. back with false, false staff and the Merry Wives of Windsor. You know, exactly. um, what's be which one is better, you know, Verdi exactly. or Shakespeare? You know, it's the, 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 it's, you're absolutely right. There are great films based on uh, that have been based on you know even great great books, um, but some th and the, that transformation can occur. Um, it's just it's it's different, and um, we are, we are guilty, all of us, of judging films by their the, their sources. We should just say, did I enjoy that film? Did it move me? Did it shock me? Did it uh, entertain me? Did it uh, um, disturb me? And if it did, then it worked as as a film in its own art form. We don't then have to compare it to its original source. And I think that's what I'm always banging on about. And so many film critics in particular constantly make the comparison. Just say, how was that aesthetic experience as a cinematic one rather than an adaptation? And then you can enjoy the film or not um, you know, with a clear conscience. I think that's, that's the, the mind shift that has to occur. Um, stop making the comparison. I mean, as 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 I say, you know, it's absurd to say Verdi spoiled uh, the Merry Wives of Windsor. And people would laugh at you if you said it. But people constantly say, you know, that uh, you know, Scorsese's adaptation of Edith Wharton's novel was a travesty. You know, but it was actually not a bad film. You know, so mm. so uh, that's what I think has to occur. This allow the art form to to be judged and succeed on its own terms, not on the terms of another art form. I have an example in mind, uh, which is the unbearable uh, lightness of human being from Milan Kundera. Uh, this book is very, very important in my decision, together with uh, William's books and Jim Harrison's books, to, uh, in my decision to start a right. And I love this book so much um, when, when, when it, c it came out. And when I saw the film, uh, 
it was not my idea of the book, but I, I, I felt that the film was a kind of masterpiece. I, I couldn't explain, explain why, because there was something in this movie um, added to the book. Uh, and, and both, both are, are, are very interesting for me. So even if, if the film was not exactly because the problem is that uh, our ego is doing a lot in our life, as you know. And of course, we want to see the film that we have in our imagination. But sometimes it's something totally different, totally different, and it's very, very sweet. That's it. Um, uh, Logan Mount Stewart is a kind of amalgam of uh, various... Um rackety English writers. Uh, he's a, there's a bit of Lawrence Durrell in him. Um, there's a bit of Henry Green in him. Um, but he's actually quite... His life pattern is very close to a completely forgotten English writer called William Gerhardy. And William Gerhardy in the 1920s was the most famous young writer in Britain. He was the Zadie Smith of his day. And... Uh, he was a huge influence on Evelyn Waugh, Graham Greene, Anthony Powell. Um, but his career started to go, started brilliantly, and it went downhill from there on. And he, he published his last novel in 1940, and he died in 1977. So there were 37 years of silence and oblivion and neglect and poverty. Uh, and so he's a terrible warning to all us novelists, uh, about how the wheels can come off your career very dramatically. So he's sort of based on that kind of English writer, another writer, Cyril Connolly, who I like very much. But I, just, I really wanted to write a book about a life, uh, a whole life from very earliest childhood to almost the last minute before Logan dies. And it seemed to me that the century that I was born in was the perfect one to do it. And in fact, Logan is born in 1906 and he dies in 1991 at the age of 85. So he's lived in every single decade of the 20th century. So it gave it a kind of neatness that this one human life with all its terrible ups and downs and all, all its problems and tragedies and, and comic moments uh, actually spanned the century we were just leaving, because I, I wrote the book uh, over the millennium. It was published in, in 2002. So it was, I think it was, it's very odd to leave a century behind. And uh, it, I think in a way, it sort of was my millennium book in a funny sort of sense. But I, it was really the urge to get a whole life in all its um, messy, tragic comedy down on paper, and uh, and I decided because I've all, like Mark, I've uh, I've always not wanted to write books about other writers. It's the only book I've written where the central character is a writer, but because he's so unsuccessful, I thought I could get away with it. But um, it's uh, it, that was the that was the the original idea to to take a, 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 a human life, a long human life, and sort of make it representative, and. Um, even though he has an extraordinary life, it is the one novel I've written which I have had more letters about than any of the others, and I've had letters from 16-year-old girls and 90-year-old men. So it seems to ring a chord with all sorts of readers because I think it is a, a full life in all its uh, messy detail. Um, well, I, I do. Um, I have uh, f friends who live there. I haven't been back for a long time. And my child, I was born in Ghana. I lived there till I was nine or ten. And then my parents moved to Nigeria. So I have this sort of the two countries in West Africa were my home until my early 20s. So I, I feel um, a very close connection with my African youth. And I think though I don't want to overanalyze it, it's had an enormous effect on my writing. And so I, um, I still have connections with both countries, um, though my Ghanaian memories are ones of an idyllic childhood, really. My Nigerian memories are far more complex and, and intriguing because 
when I was in living in Nigeria, we had three military coups and a civil war. And also I became very involved in Nigerian politics later because a Nigerian writer friend of mine, Ken Sarawiwa, was arrested by the Nigerian military government and imprisoned and released and eventually executed um, 10 years ago. So I've had a, a, a long and lasting connection with West Africa, uh, or those two countries in West Africa. But um, I have my parents left in the mid 70s, so it ceased to be my home. Um, and so it's, it is a kind of nostalgia rather than anything I've experienced in the last uh, several years. But it's, it's you know, it, I'm 58 now. I spent 20 odd years in, in West Africa. It's had a profound effect on me as a person and as a writer. Thank you. Do you still have a connection with Senegal? Uh, in Senegal, yes, I, I go there quite often because, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the ambassador um, to France in Senegal is uh, a writer, is uh, Ruffin. Was? Is, is, she, is he still there? He's still there. Mm -hmm. They killed him? No, not no? yet. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. As he's a good friend of mine, I would like to know. I know he wants now, he, he's quite ambitious, he wants to be part of the French Académie Française. Um, he's been a doctor, ambassador. Uh, now he wants to. Uh, he like he like a little bit. Uh, he like a little bit of medals. But, but but I like him very much. He's a very good guy. So I went to visit him uh, two years ago. Uh, an awful flight from uh, Casablanca, where I live. And um, uh, yeah, I, I go there quite often. I, I don't know why, because it's my... Uh, I don't feel very comfortable, to be honest, uh, in Senegal, because I have, I have the feeling that corruption is so... so, so big that uh, it makes uh, things difficult to progress. But out of this, of course, I like the country because I was born there. I think we're finished. <laughs>